Welcome church family, welcome to Calvary Chapel, East Dulwich. I hope you're all well, I hope you're staying safe as we continue to be on lockdown, we continue to be on smash and you know these are trying times but thank the Lord for technology, thank the Lord that we can stay connected through prayer meetings, through women's meetings, through men's meetings and you know it's just been a blessing that we could have things like Zoom and YouTube where we can just in a sense stay connected and stay interactive with each other so it's difficult times but God is good all the time and so before we go into our study today let's have a quick word of prayer and then we'll jump into what the Lord has to say to us today. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you again for another opportunity, Lord, where we can look for the scriptures, where we can look for the text, Lord, and see what you would have to say to us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the book of Hebrews. Thank you for the inspiration you gave to the author of the book of Hebrews, Lord, who basically is just use words, your spoken word, Lord, to inspire us, to encourage us, Lord, to help us as we walk this walk of faith, Lord. And so as we look at the text today, as we look at the hall of faith today, Lord Jesus, I just pray you to really encourage our hearts, encourage our souls, Lord, keep us, help us to stay, stay to the, true to the cause, help us to stay faithful to you, Lord Jesus, and throughout our lives, Lord, that your name will be lifted up and you will be glorified. So we commit this time into your hands, in your holy and precious name. And all of God's family said, Amen. Amen. So, we are in the book of Hebrews. And we are in chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews. And we've been going through Hebrews for a while now. So we're in Hebrews chapter 11. And if you were with us last week, or if you've been following along, you know that last week we took some time to look at Moses' parents, um, Amram and Jochebed. And we considered how, you know, there's one, many wonderful examples which they gave us and how they, they went against Pharaoh's edict to, to throw all, all the Hebrew uh, male children into the river Nile and to, to kill them that way. But basically they went against uh, Pharaoh's edict and they kept baby Moses because they were not intimidated by what we looked at last week, if you remember, the fear of man. And, you know, they weren't intimidated by the fear of ridicule either. And so, you know, when we consider these things, we know that this is such a real thing for many people. It's a real feel that, thing that, you know, the fear of man could be an overwhelming um, thought. It could be an overwhelming battle and struggle within our minds. And it could be an overwhelming thing we have to deal with when we're relating to to different people because we just have this fear of of what may, people may think of us the the fear of you know how they how other people may treat us and so you know um, the fear of man is a very very real thing and so God gave them the ability and their strength to go against the fear of man and to do, remain faithful to him and I suppose that when we think about the fear of man for Christians I suppose it highlights even more if you're out if you're trying to witness to someone or that God gives you a word to give to someone and basically uh, you start having that inward struggle of oh should I shouldn't I should I shouldn't I how will I you know what they're going to think of me all these things here and so the fear of man, they went against the fear of man, they went against Pharaoh's edicts and they kept um, baby Moses. And I mentioned last week that the backstory to what was going on was that Satan was trying to prevent the promise of Genesis 3.15. I mean, I know at this point there wasn't a Genesis 3.15, but the story had been handed down, you see. And so Satan's trying to stop, you know, the seed of the woman coming through to bless the whole world. And so he uses Pharaoh. Pharaoh is a type and picture of, of Satan. And uh, what we see within this whole thing is that even though Satan had a plan and he was a, and he was going he was executing his plan, God had a plan and God was in control. And that's that's the, the great thing about it, that even though it didn't didn't necessarily seem like God had a plan and God was in control, God was in control. You see? We saw the providence of God, how you know, he moved upon Amram and Jochebed's heart in order to keep baby Moses. Then he 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 moved upon their heart to to place Moses in an ark. The ark was there to protect him, and then put him in the river. Which and the river was close to where Pharaoh's daughter 
her palace was and then he moved upon Pharaoh's daughter's heart in order to go and bathe at the time be inquisitive about the ark she saw in the river and then basically get it and then so seeing the baby crying she had compassion upon baby Moses and then she too then went against her own father's edict in order to save the child hand the child back um to Moses's parents real parents even though she didn't know that at the time until Moses was of a certain age where he was then brought back to Pharaoh's daughter but in the meantime in the in the in between time Moses parents basically taught him about the God of their fathers. They taught him about Abraham, Isaac, and Joseph. And they taught him about, you know, the promises of God and the, and the future kingdom. And they taught him about all these things. And, and so, just want to say that in those times where we may find ourselves that we don't really know what's going on, and I think a large part of this message is, is, is kind of like revolving around it to a degree, we don't necessarily know what's going on and Satan is going about his business you know like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour we know that his plan is to kill steal and destroy we have to believe that God always has a plan we have to believe that God is in control and if you are in Christ you know we have to learn in those situations we have to learn how to trust in him by faith and believe that he can work all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And so after that intro, let us um, jump into Hebrews chapter 11. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Um, we're going to be focusing on verses 26 to 29 today. But just to keep that little chunk within its context, let's read from verse 23 down to 29. And then we'll see what the Lord will say. So Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured the seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea, as by dry ground, dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. Amen. And so last week, as I said, I mentioned that verses 24 to 27, they can be broken down basically into four groups. Moses refused. Moses chose, Moses esteemed, Moses forsook, which if you think about this for the first hand hearers of this message, this letter, you know, it would have been interesting for them to to hear um, what the author has written down here, because they too were being asked to refuse, refuse Judaism in its present form and choose to choose Christ. And to esteem Christ as being better, forsaking what they had basically been raised in, the belief system they had been raised in. You know, in a sense, they were asked to forsake that, um, forsake going to the synagogue and thinking that, you know, salvation could be gained through ob observing the feast and, and doing works, um, doing the works of the law. But now they had to embrace a personal relationship with Christ because we know as we take it through the cross we know that salvation is by grace and by grace alone exactly what Ephesians 2 8 tells us for by grace you have been saved through faith and that is not of yourselves what is it it is a gift of God and not of works lest anyone should boast so if there was anyone who could boast of works then I suppose Moses could boast of works but the author is highlighting that it was always by faith. 
So Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter because he knew he was a child of God, which I tried to highlight last week. You know, for Moses, it wasn't a light thing because if historians are, are accurate, then Moses was technically in line to be the next ruler of Egypt. And Egypt was a, a, was a, was a, was a superpower during that time. And so Moses had everything at his feet. He could have had anything he wanted. And so it wasn't a light thing for Moses to refuse this. But Moses could see the genuine from the fake. You know, I think the story goes that, you know, the, the phrase, the real McCoy, you see, it's like, you know, when, when I don't even know exactly how the story goes, but when, when somebody showed, showed an invention or whatever it was and it looked a bit they said no nah, that's that's not the real mccoy you know because mccoy there was a standard which was the real mccoy and everybody knew no nah, that's not the real mccoy that's the real mccoy well anyway long story short moses could see what was genuine he could see which was which 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 was eternal and not temporary and so he knew what was fake he knew he knew that he wasn't going to be sucked in by the glitz and the glam of Egypt and he chose rather chose rather to suffer affliction um, who's going to choose to rather suffer affliction than the glitz and the glam you see that's a big choice there you know are you going to pamper to the flesh or are you going to choose what the spirit of God is telling us to do and so he chose rather to suffer affliction the children of God verse 26 esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. And so he said, you know what? Egypt, what Christ has to offer. What Egypt has to offer, what Christ has to offer. And he looked and he said, there's no comparison. You know, what 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 Egypt has to offer is nothing compared to what Christ offers me. And he looked to the reward. Now, he looked to the reward which, which Christ had to offer. Um, and I suppose... I asked myself the question about this verse, which was, and about the text, was, what did Moses know about Christ? I mean, nothing specific, because Christ still hadn't even come on the scene, right? And so, just thinking, I was sort of like doing a bit of eisegesis into the text, and I'm just taking it for granted again, that through the stories which was handed down to Moses from his parents, and from his forefathers, that they knew about the promised Messiah. He knew about the future king who would reign over his future city. And, and through this future king, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And, the, and this is why at the end of, of Moses' journey in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, this is why he could say, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. So he's speak, speaking about the future messiah you see and so so within this i believe within that verse to a degree he could see that the future reward of christ jesus the future reward of what christ will come he would overcome sin he, 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 and then give us an eternal inheritance you see and so i believe he's alluding to that and i also believe that the author is in a sense making comparisons um making comparisons about Moses and his experience and Christ and his experience and how Moses, in a sense, was rejected when he, um, or, or he rejected Egypt and the world. And basically Christ was offered the world when Satan basically in the temptation when Satan sort of like came to him and, and offered him all the kingdoms of the world and so when Christ is nice nah, okay I don't want it you see so Moses rejected Egypt and the world and and Christ rejects the te rejects the temptation of, of of Satan in the wilderness Moses was rejected by his brethren on the first occasion just as Christ was rejected by his brethren on the, on his first occasion and in his first coming and Jesus we know he's still rejected by his brethren even today. But Moses was received on his second on his second coming, his second occasion, just as Christ will be received in his second coming. And we know Christ is going to be received by Israel when they cry out, Blessed is he 
who comes in the name of the Lord, Barak Habib Bashem Adonai. So Moses and Christ, you see the similarities there, but Moses could look to see that it's Christ who's going to provide all these future promises for me. It was Moses who came and established God's standard of the law and Christ came and fulfilled the law and continued to establish the Father's standard. And then we have the verse in John 1.17 says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And so there's similarities, there's pictures, there's types, there's patterns. And, and I suppose Moses could, could look forward to the future reward of what he was a type and a shadow of, as it were. Esteeming the reproach of Christ's greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. So Moses is looking forward. He's looking for, he was looking forward for the same reward, the same reward which I believe Abel was looking for, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, um, Jacob, Isaac, Joseph. You know, they're looking forward to this future reward. And basically it was future for them. And even today in 2020, it's still future for us because we're still looking forward for that future reward. And so because we're still looking forward to that future reward, we still have to hold fast to the same principles which they held to, which was to walk by faith, to, to walk by faith and not by sight, to live by faith, to know that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things may not necessarily be seen right now, you know. But we live by faith. We walk by faith in it anyway. Verse 27. By faith he, Moses, forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. See, Moses forsook Egypt, but it wasn't just a random thing which he just done. You know, see, he was contemplating this. And so the, the, the work which he had to do first had to be done within his heart. He first had to forsake Egypt within his heart. He had to forsake Egypt within his mind so that Egypt was never just like this tempting thing to draw him back to. You know, he forsook Egypt and he forsook it not fearing the wrath of Pharaoh. Pharaoh, you know, just think about it. I mean, the, the text in Hebrews doesn't go to, to the plagues, the 10 plagues or anything, but, you know, he didn't fear the wrath of the king knowing that, you know, he, he had left Egypt for like 40 odd years and he had left sort of like being a murderer. And when he came back, who's to say that the Pharaoh didn't say, ah, oh, yeah, we got you now. It hasn't been time served. We're going to throw you into prison. Could have said that, right? But every time he, he, he went before Pharaoh, it's like God was with him. Yeah, he was fearful, but he knew that God was with him. Aaron was with him as well. And basically not fearing the wrath of the king he forsook all that stuff then says you know what my god has said pharaoh you need to let my people go and that's the message i have for you and i'm here just to sort of like usher in that purpose of my god so when moses developed this attitude of not fearing the wrath of god we see that moses continued this trait of what i said last week it was a hebrew word called chutzpah yeah, chutzpah, and it's basically bravery. He continued this trait of having bravery, and when this is used within the text, it's it's saying that Moses had bravery, and in a way, it's used in contrast to to Abraham and Isaac, because if you remember, I said it before a couple of weeks ago, both Abraham and Isaac lied about their wives actually being their wives and said that they were their sisters because they were fearful they had fear of man so now this is being contrasted and that Moses doesn't have fear of man you know Moses does have this say he had this chutzpah and we too I believe have to be people of faith who have to develop this this chutzpah and it's a bit like um, if you think into the book of Acts where where Stephen now is standing up before you know the, the religious leaders and everything and he has bravery he has boldness he has 
chutzpah and basically starts declaring about, you know, starts bringing them from Genesis all the way through and everything. It tells them that basically they've missed they've missed the Messiah and they've lost the plot and everything and then they end up stoning him. But he had chutzpah in order to do that. You think about Hananiah, Azariah and Mishael when the king makes the edict that everybody has to bow down to the to the to the image or they would have to go into the fiery furnace. You see, they was like, Oh king, do you know what I mean? We're not gonna bow down to your image. You know what I mean? But I'm gonna throw you into the fiery furnace. We don't care. Um our God is able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't deliver us, we're still not bowing down to your image. You see that holds spot. You see? And so Daniel as well, you know, there was an edict that people couldn't pray or, or however it went and Daniel basically says, no, I'm going to still pray to my God. And they basically threw him into the lions. Then it's like, I'm going to defy your orders because it's contravening my God's orders. And so he developed this, this chutzpah, this, this bravery, this boldness. And, you know, and there may come a time where we as believers have to really stand up and develop this chutzpah, this bravery, this boldness when declaring the truth of God's word. When we're in conversation with people and they're talking a load of nonsense and we're like, actually... That's not even true. This is what the scripture says. This is what is true. We may have to develop that. Anywho. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. See, Moses could do this because, again, he knew that faith, this thing called faith, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So he was able to endure as seeing him who is invisible. Now, in my mind, I was thinking the encounter Moses had with God at the burning bush. Now, he saw the bush and it was like it was burning and it wasn't being consumed. And that caught his attention. And so he looks and he thinks, why is this bush burning not being consumed and then God speaks to him he hears the voice he doesn't necessarily see an image but he hears a voice he knows it's God he has a conversation with God and the, and it and it's all just real to him you know and so that was real to him and so he was able to endure the seeing him who is invisible we had the encounter when Moses was with, with God on the mountain. He goes, I want to see your glory. And he says, you can't see my glory. Because if you see my glory, no one can see my, my glory and live. But i tell you what, go in the cliff, cliff of the rock. And, and as I pass by, you know, you would see, you know, the back half of me and everything. And that, that's going to be cool for you. You see what I mean? So, so in a sense, Moses had physical experiences where he had encounters with God um, but he didn't physically see Jesus in my opinion um, he saw manifestations or the cloud for example when he came in the temple and things like that but he knew God was real and I'm just so saying this that he had to believe in a God who was invisible to a degree but he believed anyway and we too we too we have to um, believe in the invisible God and this is what first Timothy chapter 1 verse 17 tells us so the king eternal immortal invisible to God who alone is wise be honor and glory forever and ever and ever and ever amen you see it's lovely we believe in the invisible God so this trust in the invisible God enabled Moses to endure and it has to enable us to keep going also, even when the going gets tough, we have to endure. And the going got tough for Moses because when he was with the children of Israel in the wilderness, they kept on giving him trouble. They kept on moaning and complaining, but we'll get into it in a little bit. Now, from verse 28, it's like the author switches the topic um, to the Passover because the Passover... It was, and it still is, central to the Jewish faith. And the author's point in highlighting the Passover is that everything which was done, you know, revolving around that first Passover was done by faith. And everything about that first Passover was pointing to something greater. 
And even when the Jews, even today, when they celebrate or they observe the Passover, they should, they, they, in a sense, even they're doing it in the wrong way because they don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. But it's being done by faith that God will send a Messiah, you see. So it's, there, there's, there's faith which has to be applied within the whole process. So by faith, he, Moses, kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood. So the author is careful to mention the Passover and the sprinkling of blood. Because we know in the book of Hebrews it says without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin. So you have to add the blood here. It was Moses who was given the instructions, who was given the word from the Lord to institute the first Passover. And we can read about this in the next this chapter 12. Now, I think the way we've got to think about this is like this. Before this instruction from God, there had never been a Passover before. The children of Israel had never ever been asked to sacrifice a lamb in this particular way and then apply its blood to the doorpost and to the lintel of their house and then lay the innocent blood um, of the lamb and, and lay the lamb between the doorpost and the lintel. And and as they were being asked to do this, they didn't even realise as they were doing this that, that this was foreshadowing what Christ will do in the future. It was foreshadowing what Christ will do on the cross at Calvary. And in Exodus, it says, Exodus chapter 12, verse 7 says, And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they sh which would be the lamb. Then they shall eat the flesh of that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. So God basically command gives gives Moses the instructions. Moses basically conveys the construct the instructions to the to the children of Israel, and they have to observe this. Observe this. Now, in order to stay safe, they had to observe this. In order to stay safe, they had to trust. They had to trust in and believe in what God had said because it was, as I said, it was God who gave the commandment to Moses. And so, follow the rules, follow the instructions, sacrifice the lamb, apply the blood on the doorpost and lintel, and, and stay in the house and partake of the lamb. And then it goes on to say in Exodus chapter 12, verse 13, Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood. So basically, God is the one who gave them the instructions and told them what to do. And they say, look, make sure you do this, because when now when I see the blood, you know, and when I see you basically in your houses where I've told you to be, feasting on the lamb which I told you to feast on when I see the blood I will pass over you and the plague shall shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt now if they didn't obey the word of the Lord then the angel of death would come upon that house and strike the firstborn and so they had to exercise faith in what God had said they had to they had to trust in what God had said believe in what God is in order to stay safe and it goes and jumping back to Hebrews first chapter 11 verse 28 lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them so you want to stay safe follow the rules apply the faith so we have being presented to us this picture that that the first Passover night was different to any other night which which the children of Israel, which the Hebrews had ever ever experienced. And on one side of the first night of the Passover was slavery because they were slaves in Egypt. But on the other side, on the other side of the first night of the Passover was what? Deliverance, freedom. Freedom for I think it's in the book of Numbers, it says that 600,000 men 
not counting women and children. It's freedom for six, almost two million people. Freedom. And so it was freedom from Egypt. And we know that Egypt is always a picture of the world within the scriptures. And so the condition for freedom was that every household had to take God at his word. And I'm just stressing this point because there's conditions, right? You have to take God at his word. You have to believe in what God has said. Apply faith. You cannot have a belief system which is just made up in your own minds. You have to see what God has said. You have to follow what God has said. And so bringing this through the, through the cross, as it were, when we accept Christ in our hearts as our, as our personal Lord and Saviour, which is spoken about in Romans 10, we accept the Lamb of God pictured in the Passover, the Lamb of God, which John the Baptist said of Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We have to receive him and basically accept him as our personal Lord and Saviour. And then we are set free. We are delivered from Egypt. We are delivered. We are set free from the world. Put in another way, we are taken out of Adam and we're placed into Christ. We are taken out of Adam in the kingdom of darkness. And we're born again. That's where the phrase comes from. Born again into Christ. In the kingdom of his light. Into, into the kingdom of the son of his love. And it's just a wonderful exchange. You know we, we forsake Egypt. We forsake the world. We embrace Christ. We embrace his kingdom. And it's an exchange which we cannot buy. We cannot earn. We just have to accept it as a free gift, which is spoken about in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. And so they applied the blood on the first Passover. And again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, it says that Christ is our Passover and he has been sacrificed for us. And so you see the pictures, the types, the shadows all coming into play here. So, pictures, type, shadows, all pointing to the real reality, and the reality is Christ Jesus. Now, another interesting thought about the first Passover night is that they left the houses of bondage, which were now, you know, there, empty, and they had the blood applied to it. And then they went on their journey with the Lord. And I just sort of like saw this picture here. I'm not going to make a doctrine out of it. But, you know, I just saw this picture out how we also will eventually leave these bodies of flesh and receive new redemptive bodies. And then we go on our journey with the Lord in eternity. Just a thought. Then... In verse 29 of Hebrews, the author basically switches cameras again or he changes lens, whatever he does. And he highlights that once Israel had left Egypt, then, you know, it wasn't like, oh, praise the Lord, hallelujah, everything's going to be great now. No, it wasn't all plain sailing because straight away they encountered difficulty and the, 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 the major problem they faced was the Pharaoh was vexed, you know, he was, he was vexed at what happened, you know, think about it, all the firstborn males in Egypt were now dead, think about it, the place, you know, 2 million people, 600,000 men, women, children, roughly 2 million people and all now not there, the place was like a ghost town, who was there to do the manual labor who you know the whole slave labor force was now gone you know and the egyptians were in stress because and in despair because there was so much death and so pharaoh basically gets to the point where he's just like you know what why did i allow this to happen i'm gonna go after you know as far as he was concerned the main culprit, the person who was to blame for all this, was this person called, drawn out of the water, drawn from water, Moses. 
So basically, Pharaoh gets his army together and he goes after Israel. And this part of the story is found in Exodus chapter 14. And when Pharaoh caught up with the children of, of Israel, he basically got them in a position where they were trapped. You know, Israel had Pharaoh on one side and they had the Red Sea on the other side and they were camped in the middle. And they were boxed in, trapped. And maybe some of you may be feeling like that right now. Maybe some of you are feeling like, do you know what? I just feel whatever my situation is, whatever my circumstance of life is right now, I feel trapped. And so the thing is, what to do? Now, what to do? Moan, bicker, complain, or trust God? And the funny thing is that as you read the text within Exodus chapter 14, Israel basically did both. They moaned and they complained. But they had to trust God. And the question I ask is, is basically... Did the moaning and the complaining do anything to change their situation? Did it do anything to change their situation? No, it didn't. Is moaning and complaining doing anything to change our situation? No, it isn't. And this is why the Bible tells us that, you know, when we find ourselves and we find that we may feel trapped in our circumstances, the best thing to do is jump into that prayer closet and pray. Pray without ceasing. Pray with all prayer and all supplication so that these difficult situations we find ourselves in our lives, you know, at least we give God an avenue, an inroad where he can intervene and, and, and you know, just, yeah, make an intervention within the situation, you know, and if he decides to answer and act, then that's, then praise God. But if he doesn't, praise God. So in this situation here, you know, they had deep waters in front of them and they had Pharaoh behind them um, and they had no choice but to trust God and again highlighting the point again this is exactly what we have to do when we have just trouble on many sides we have to just trust God you know it was an ideal opportunity for these guys to be anxious to worry to be fearful you know and these are very real and powerful emotions, which many of us may be feeling right now, especially, you know, as we're on lockdown, as we're on smash, you know, we may be feeling anxious, we may be feeling fearful, we may be thinking, actually, when the, when lockdown is, is, is lifted, how am I going to relate to the world again? Am I going to feel comfortable going out in public again? You know, what's that all going to look like? We may be feeling fearful, we may be feeling anxious, but again... We have verses of scripture which perhaps God just knew well ahead of time that, you know what, this verse of scripture is going to be specific for this time, which is Philippians 4. Be anxious for nothing, but in all things, in how many things? In all things, in all things through prayer and supplication. And I always miss this bit out with thanksgiving. See, we've got to be thankful, we've got to be grateful for the things, you know, for life, for the for the fact that we're in relationship with God. Giving him thanks for all things, the good, the bad, the indifferent. We give him thanks for him. Give him thanks, with thanksgiving, let our requests speak to God, be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. You see, God's peace is that guard, is that shield for your heart and for your mind, you know, but you have to do some work, you have to commit these things unto the Lord, Place, lay them at the feet of the cross, go in your prayer closet, tell him all about it, it's not like he doesn't know, he knows, but he wants to, you to share those things with him, okay, um, 1 Corinthians also, chapter 10 verse 13 says, no temptation has overtaken you, except such is common to man but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it so encouragement family that if you're you're feeling trapped you're feeling that the circumstances are becoming overwhelming and everything well we have these examples in scripture that, that basically 
trust in God. Rely upon his peace. Rely upon, um, you know, just just knowing that he is God. And this and the next thing we want to look at now, look. So Moses was confident in God. You have to be confident in God. Verse four, uh, Chapter 14, verse 13 of Exodus. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still. So do not be afraid. Don't have fear. Be anxious for nothing. Stand still. And the way I read this is like, look, don't try to manipulate your situation. Don't try and hump and hype it and add flesh to your situation. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. And that promise was true for Israel then because basically on that day when the Egyptians tried to follow them through the Red Sea, they basically got drowned and got killed. And so that was true for them that day. Verse 14 says, The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. This is what we need to do. See, in times when it's difficult, when it's getting peak, hold your peace. That's the encouragement there. And then I love the next verse. If you're in Exodus chapter 14, verse 15. And the Lord said to Moses. So Moses was speaking before. And now the Lord says to Moses. Why do you cry to me? <laughs> Why do you cry to me? But, but can't you see? Like I've got fear on one side. I've got red sea on the other side. And it's getting mad out here. What, what do you mean? Why do I cry to you? It's like he's saying. Why are you crying to me? And it's like. Tell the children of Israel. To go forward. Now, when I looked at this, I just thought, what God was actually saying, in my opinion, is that He said, "Look, now is not the time for the soft word, or the the gentle pack on the back, or the there there, or the old oh, didums. It's not time for that, you know. Now, it, basically, the vertical prayers have gone up, and I've heard you, and I'm going to respond. But now you have to do something." You have to act upon this faith here now. So it's like, I'm going to speak to you on that vertical level so we get across here, right? And so now it's time to do something which was to what? Bruv, Moses, don't be crying out to me. Keep this thing moving, bruv. But moving's into the Red Sea. I know. Move into that Red Sea. Just lift up your rod and the sea's going to part and you're going to walk through. What? Is that what's going to happen? Yeah, exactly. You have faith? Yes. And so... He says, but lift up your rod, Moses, and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. So by faith, we're back in Hebrews now, verse 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 29. By faith, they, the children of Israel, passed through the Red Sea as by dry ground. So the author is just painting this picture for this first-hand Hebrew congregation, right? That is, you know what? It's always been about faith. It's always been about applying faith, trusting God at his word, okay? Not conjuring up some something in your, in your head and thinking, oh, that's me having faith in God. No, no, no. That's, is it written? Has God said? You know, because that's how God establishes his faith in the scriptures. And they pass through... The Red Sea as by dry land. So what they had to do was at this point in their situation was they had to trust God for for the impossible and they had to move forward. And moving forward, you know, that's that's the direction here now. You know, moving forward. And it made me think of the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. Because when you think about the armor of God, whether it's the helmet, the breastplate, the shield of faith, the sword of spirit, the word of God, helmet, salvation, all that. And feet shod with the gospel of the preparation of peace. Um, fears like that. But anyway, there's nothing for the back. There's no protection for the back because, you know, the armor is designed for the soldier of God to keep moving forward. And God is saying... Keep it moving, Moses. Tell the children of Israel to go forward, to keep it moving. He says to us as children of God, when we're fighting this war thing, you know, this isn't about a retreating thing. It's all about keep it moving forward, okay? It's that constant walking with the Lord. It's that going into battle. And so, 
It was God who performed the miracle of the parting of the Red Sea. And I'm just thinking about this again because I think I haven't seen too many of the films to be fair. But when you think about God parting the Red Sea, don't just think like two meters. Like he would say, okay, I want you to you know, give a picture of social isolation or something like that. No, you got to think like like a hundred meters wide because. 600,000 men, not counting women and children and livestock, so 2 million-ish people are coming from one side, the Egyptian side, to the other side. That's not 2 metres, that's a, you know, and it's a big space. And the children of Israel, it says, pass through the Red Sea, which God had parted on dry ground. Exodus, if you still got a finger in Exodus, chapter 15, verse 8 says, And with the blast of your nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright like a heap. The depths congealed in the heart of the sea. And you just read that and you just think, wow, that must have been just a heavy sight. Some, that must have been spectacular. I mean, just imagine being one of the Hebrew children, sort of like, seeing this all happen before you and just kind of like and just thinking wow this is amazing it's like the waters have just parted and they're just it's like they're a wall either side of us and the ground is dry and so the picture i want us to see now is that they pass through the very circumstance which they found themselves in, if you see my point. You see, the Red Sea was there, but God parted the Red Sea. It was still the Red Sea, right? But he made a way through it. He made a way through the circumstance in order for them to go through it and be safe as they go through it and come out the other side. And I believe that we today... You know, God will make us go through stuff on our journey with him. Um, we were speaking about in our men's meeting about, you know, God allowing things to happen within our lives. And he does. It's not all a plain sailing thing when we come to relationship with Jesus. And so their circumstance in the text or in his, his Exodus was, was they had Pharaoh on one side and, and Red Sea on the other. And as I said, God will make us go through things on our journey. And it could be physical in, illness. It could be mental illness. It could be bereavement, poverty, lack, dealing with rebellious children. It could be so many different and difficult circumstances, but they trusted God then. And whatever circumstance we find ourselves in today, we have to trust God as well. And God, believe that God will help us to pass through the circumstance and on dry ground as well and I think it's important to highlight dry ground because when God provides that way through on dry you, you'll know it's God you know you, you'll know that when God parts the sea of your situation you will know without a shadow of a doubt that it is God who's done this because you know when we try to do it it's like you know, it's like when you go to the seaside and everything and the tide's gone out and it's like, and, and it's not sand, it's, or it's put a bit more muddy. It's all mushy, isn't it? It's all mushy and sticky and everything, you get dirty. But they said that they walked through on dry ground. It was a miracle. God performed a miracle. There was no shadow of a doubt about it. And it was just, you know, there was complete evidence that it was God who done this. And so... There's a lot more we could say about this whole situation of the crossing of the Red Sea, but I don't want to sort of like overdo it. Um, suffice it to say that in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us that, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the Red Sea and all were baptised into Moses and into the cloud. But, you know, it was done... For an example, it goes on to say in verse 11, they were done for his examples for us that they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So everything which we see in the Old Testament, everything we see in the Old Testament with the children of Israel, with types and shadows and everything, 
the author of Corinthians, Paul, is saying that, look, you look at those examples there and they were written as examples for us for our admonitions, for us to take note of and say, well, man, that's how they acted then. Should we copy that action or should we say, oh, they really missed it there. Let's do the opposite. You see, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So lots of things to think about. Now, when they pass through, when God opened up the Red Sea and the children of Israel passed through the, the Red Sea on dry ground, Pharaoh decided he was going to follow with his Egyptian army because he was still vexed, as I said. He still wanted to make sure, he wanted to kill the children of Israel. He wanted to bring them back to, to Egypt and put them back into slavery, whatever his, his thoughts were. But... The army tried to follow. They did follow. God basically got his angels to 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 mess around with the chariot wheels and some of the chariot wheels fell off and everything. And then basically a whole bunch of his army was in the sea. And then when the last person from the shoes of Israel actually came out of the other side and was safe, God basically allowed the sea waters just to come back together again. And then the army, the Pharaoh's army, was basically killed and so it's shame that the light and darkness it it doesn't mix you know you know it doesn't mix and just like the the children of Israel um, were saved and when we come into Christ you know through the cross we are saved the children that the, the, the Egyptians and the children of darkness they can't come over you know, they can't follow our journey because they, they're not covered by the blood. They're not covered. They haven't got that personal relationship with Jesus, you see. And so, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. You know, God has an expected end or, or not an expected end, but, but God has an eternity to work with us. But the children of darkness have an expected end. And that's being highlighted in the text there. And so we come to the end of this little portion here because next week we jump over into, into Joshua going around Jericho. Okay, and so we're coming away from Moses. But, you know, just to recap on a few things in closing, just to think about Moses' parents, you know, who showed chutzpah, defying the king's edict, saving the child because they saw that there was something special and unique about Moses so just having that that quality of of um, just being solely in tune with the Lord that when he speaks to you and they looked at that child and they said they, they knew there was something different about that child so as parents we have to look at our children and see that there's something different unique about all of our children we're not meant to prefer one child over the other Jacob made that made that um, had that problem there you know but we should train up our children in the way that they should go. So basically we look at the strengths and the weaknesses of our children, you know. If your child is not sort of like geared towards being a rocket scientist, then don't try and push them to be a rocket scientist. Do you know what I mean? That may not be the way that they should go. You see their strengths and the weaknesses and you, you try to encourage and shape and help them to 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 grow within those strengths and within within those things, you see. Um, well that's my understanding of it anyway. And so, and we teach them about the, having the fear and the admonition of the Lord. You know, we're teaching about Jesus so that when they're old, hopefully they won't depart from the faith. Hopefully they'll hold on to the belief system in Jesus and the salvation of the Lord. Um, we look at Moses and he was faced with choices. Egypt, God. The world, God. The world, God. And he chose you know, he could see the eternal value and eternal reward in one and he could see the temporal value and, you know, in the other, which, you know, sin is good for a season, but it's passing. You see, it's only good for a season. We're talking about eternal eternity here. And, you know, so there's lessons to be learned there. And also, you know, sticking with Christ, sticking with God through the difficulties and the trials. You see, um... The children of Israel, they had to learn how to trust in God. And sadly for them, that whole generation which came out of Egypt, you know, is only two who made it into the promised land, you know. 
Joshua and Caleb because they continue to have this mentality of, you know, oh, why did you bring us out into the wilderness to kill us? Wasn't there enough graves in, in Egypt? There was more food in Egypt. We had all this stuff in it. Like, in their hearts, they kept them going back to the world. They kept them going back to Egypt. And so if you're in this place now as a believer where you're struggling because you're a believer, you, you, you believe in Jesus, but, you know, the world is still kind of like got this heavy pull on your life and it keeps you drawing, you keep drawing. You need to make a decision within your heart, within your mind. Moses did that. He purposed in his heart, do you know what I mean? I've got no time for Egypt. I'd rather suffer the affliction with my brethren because I know that's what God has for me. You see, you've got to make that, you know, I think it was even um, Elijah with the prophets of, or when, when he's talking about the children of Israel and he's going against the prophets of Baal, he says, you know, purpose within your heart today, either God is God or he's not. You know what I mean? Purpose it within your heart today. You know, make that stand and then walk within it. You know, and so, and so, even through difficulties, even with, through trials, God has prompt. Jesus has promised to to get us to the other side. He's going to prepare a place for us. But as I always say, the road may not necessarily always be easy. There may be difficulty. There may be trials along the way. But through those difficult, through the difficulty, through the trials, do we hold on to? Do we trust in our God? Do we have faith? You know. To hold on to those things because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen, but we trust in them and we hope in them anyway because we have seen the written word of God. We know that His word is true, we know that His voice is true. He says that, you know, um, my sheep they hear my voice, and another they will not follow. So we hear the voice of the Lord and we know the voice of the Lord. And so I'm, I'm hoping that again, another week that we're encouraged in God's word, that we're encouraged to have a springboard to take us into the, to this new week and that, um, and that you've been blessed. So uh, continue to pray for each other, continue to pray for, for me. Um, and yeah, I think that's it for today. God bless you family. Let's just pray. And then, um, Heavenly Father, we thank you for another opportunity, Lord, where we can um, sit underneath your word and allow your your scriptures, Lord, just to wash over us. And um, I pray, Lord Jesus, that, you know, we've just been blessed today. I pray, Lord, that um, your word says it will not return unto you void. It will accomplish all that has been set forth to do. And so... Whatever you've desired to set, for, you've desired to do within people's hearts, within their minds today, Lord, to um, make decisions, make choices, to stand upon your word, Lord. I pray that you'd give them the strength. I pray that you give them the 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 ability, the chutzpah, the boldness, the bravery, Lord, to to stand upon your word, to trust in you, Lord, and to bring glory to your name. And so, again, thank you for this opportunity. We give you thanks in your holy and precious name, in Jesus' name. And again, all of God's family, all of God's church says, Amen. Amen. So I look forward to seeing you again soon. Amen. God bless.